It is May the 20th, 2023, and you are listening to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Back with another episode, all the three of us. Hello, band Hello. is back together again. Yay! It's good. Wonderful. I feel like I haven't seen you guys for ages. Well, the, the last two episodes, you two recorded on your own, and I, I released them from somewhere on the road. It was nice, nice collaboration here yeah. behind yes. the scenes. I've been traveling a bit, back home for a bit, and yeah. You know, yeah, I had a short vacation, I held a workshop, like things just happening as they do. So, um, which pretty much brings us to today's, well, is it a topic? I'm not sure. It's a discussion. We want to talk about something um, because I, of course, we have been talking about the future of photography and how AI is going to end parts of photography and uh, so... I had oh. this workshop. End and photography completely. Is the yes, of course, of course. <laughs> photography is over. So I have, I've had this workshop. It's, a, it's, the, it's the most important one for me. It's a once a year thing. It's uh, down in su southern Germany in an old, previously uh, was used as an abbey. It's a big, big building. They have like, I don't know, 70 beds there. There's like five, six uh, rooms for groups to work in. And we are one of three groups there once a year. And uh, yeah, we spend an entire week there. Starts on Monday, ends on Saturday morning. And the entire group this year was 30 people. Um, we, we learn, we eat together. Everyone is in the same house. So it's pretty much a 24-7 photography affair for a week and then people get, go into groups that's one part of it where people work in groups on a specific project that they choose themselves and every day they have a couple of hours to work on these projects part of that is um, part of that workshop is just general classroom type stuff where we, we teach but then the group work is kind of important and it culminates in the Friday evening big presentation the other the other uh, classes in the in the house visit and uh, people who work in the house visit and some people from the village visit and so it's a bit of an affair and everyone is is kind of excited to show off the work they worked on for an entire week and Here's, before I have a question I have a question sure go ahead were any actual photographs taken. <laughs> That, that's that that is kind of the, that is kind of the question we need to talk about so um I, I did i i was i was i didn't know what to expect this year because since last year last year was in may too uh since last year things have changed right um we have had a lot of ai come on the scene we had a lot of people generating stuff and exploring art in new ways and people who hadn't had the, the skills to make photographs can now make pictures that can actually disguise themselves as photographs. Disguise themselves, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so we, we, I didn't know what, ex what to expect because that, that's, it's a fairly nerdy group. Like I'd say two thirds of them are, really deep into the weeds of photography and into art and into well some some are tech heads they want their gear they play with i mean one one group last year they did one of these uh, dropping something off off uh, dropping a ball into sand a steel ball into sand and timing this by the millisecond with the camera and a flash and like that Didn't kind Galileo of stuff Sorry. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> not, not with a camera, I think. But <laughs> beat them too. It was Neil Armstrong, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not with a camera, I think. But you know, you, you get the idea. So, so some of that is very techy. Some of that is more on the art side. Some people don't really know a lot about their cameras. Some people know every single button, forwards and backwards, and so it's a, it's a very good mix. And I didn't know what to expect. And we kicked this workshop off. And uh, one thing we do every morning is kind of a morning round. We, we discuss what, what, what went well last night or yesterday. What 
do, do you have any questions? Is there a topic you want to discuss in the next 20 minutes? Just a quick, like, here's a list of 20 examples of topics and could be about technical stuff, could be about landscape photography, could be about AI, could be about, and so on. The list includes a lot of suggestions for topics. And none of these mornings AI was chosen. <laughs> oh. Not a single one. So when the groups put their projects together, and we're talking 30 people, groups of maybe three, maybe four. So we had like eight groups, I think. The one group out of these eight groups had the idea of maybe integrate AI into that project a little. And what they did was they, they had a, they explored a, an art, a topic, and they wanted to have a kind of a juxtaposition between some images and, uh, and, and, and the same thing generated by AI. And in that, in their presentation, it was like a five-minute slideshow or something. Um, there was, was one single AI image in there. In the entire workshop, in the final presentation, we saw one single AI image. AI was not an issue, not a topic. AI did not exist during that week. I and wonder a year, from, a year from now if that will be similar. Like, are they... Like here, it's almost impossible to have a discussion around a dinner table, a restaurant, etc., with friends who are in all manner of of the call it creative processes, whether writing, researching, scientific, artistic. That AI is not currently front and center, especially economics as well. How to integrate it with business? How to raise money? How not to raise money? How to go? private, open source, uh, closed. All of these things seem to have dominated not only the news cycle, which is kind of guilty of, as we all know, hyping, you know, whether it's any kind, like last year was crypto, 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 it used to be blockchain, 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 then it was dot com, dot com, dot com. You know what I mean? So, but But this year seems different because we have technologies that are, running faster than the human race can keep up with it even uh, and i think i think that might have something to do with the circles that that uh, you and i uh, are in because the the circle of this workshop was pretty much most Purist. of them non non-professional mm -hmm. so not, none of them makes money with photography they do photography cuz they love to do photography mm -hmm. And that means AI was not, it was about photography. And um, I, did, I didn't expect it that to be that, that clear cut. Now, in a business context, and if we talk large language models and whatever is going on in that realm and, uh, and, and the different uh, generators and stuff, that is a different story in a, in, a, in a commercial context, in a business context, but in a personal development context it did not exist for a week which was weird was it because i was going to ask you my question is how did that make you feel because you've been immersed in this stuff for a, a while now well yeah it it first of all it, it was it was kind of refreshing because it was it was <laughs> I'm, I, I am, I'm one of those who constantly wants to discuss these things because it's so exciting what's <laughs> going on. So uh, not doing this for a week, hey, it, it changed it changed things. It made uh, it, it was relaxing. Let's put it that way. It was it was kind of like being in a different world. It is also the the setting there. It's this old abbey. It's a it's a nature preserve. It's all it's everything is green. There's there's like <coughs> birds birds tweeting all day. It's a very relaxing setting and atmosphere. You know, Chris, so not just, talking just send, about send me AI a paragraph week. description on it and <laughs> I'll send you some, I'll send you some images. Yeah, exactly. So um yeah, I, I don't I I I I'm still I, I came away from this by being a slightly confused because that AI didn't happen for a week. You know, it's funny you said that because this week though as, you know, as 
my I've had a little more time to kind of organize some of the work that I've been doing in AI because I haven't really had time to take actual photos being on location and directing and producing. Um, but I have, you know, in the early morning hours or late at night or whatnot of generating some ideas and, and keeping track of it and then, you know, home now trying to input it into Lightroom and organize it for later output. But one thing did grab me and I haven't been able to stop. And this, this is the techno nerdist photographer in me. When Leica announces the new Q3, which honestly, I do not need that camera. And yet, <laughs> and yet, when I read the specs, which are not significantly different than the camera that I own, I wanted one immediately, and like, I just go, why, why, why? I didn't even bring it with me on this trip, but I don't know. That camera, which I've all, always said is one of my, the best cameras that I've ever used, pound for pound, all in, now has a 60 megapixel. Not that I'm a pixel peeper, but maybe I am. And You obviously are. <laughs> obviously I am, and, and, and also you know, started to think about the corrosion uh, in my monochrome, which is not terrible and addressable in, in Lightroom with, you know, filters and whatnot. But I found a, a company called Colari, which will uh, fix it, albeit not super expensive, not super cheap, but not horrible. And not, not that I'm doing it this week, but I've been thinking about cameras endlessly and thinking about the process of burning plates, for example, as I did last year, and making a gravure out of some of my photos, which is just as pure as it can get, and getting very excited about that particular process, which I now can really separate the process of making a photographic illustration, which is really what AI is doing. It's making a hyper-neorealistic illustration um, uh, in diffusion models with large language uh, models and, and, and the act of taking a picture and bringing it up to and through uh, the process. And thinking about them in very different ways in terms of expression. Um, looking at my own work uh, and seeing what influences my own work can have on me currently. Like old pictures that I thought were just okay, integrating that into a process, reprocessing them, and finding new, exciting imagery within my own images, then starting to build my own model. So there is that gray area now that exists between the process, the pure process of taking and making a photograph with cameras, film, or digits, and how to use AI to either enhance, edit, reconfigure, describe, uh, reprocess, that makes you want to take more pictures and do different things with it. In other words, I'll take a picture where I used to be excited about bringing it into Photoshop and going, look what I can do really fast and adjusting all of these things and creating a look and uh, you know, a, a filter and a condition of aesthetics. Now I have another massive tool to do the same thing. And that is sort of a new, um, new thinking for me in terms of how I'm embracing AI. Not that I, I kind of turn my back on AI just purely from the kind of um, language model, because I, I also uh, trained GPT-4 to, to work with me and create really, really uh, interesting personalized prompts and formats that have really conditioned the output of Midjourney in really, really magical ways. So now integrating these things is, is another thing. But I have not yet tried to upload an image into Midjourney, I mean into ChatGPT, have it describe the image, like you can do on Midjourney, but in a much more, I feel, sophisticated way, and then output it back to me. Um, so I think we as photographers are entering uh, new territory here that is as 
um, I guess as exciting as ever was a uh, a software process uh, or hardware software combination to take one's photography further and yet keep it in the boundaries of what we consider a more purist approach. I'm looking forward, Jeremiah, to the release of your prompt preset pack GPT four, you know, Mid Journey yep. and Lightroom, right? So, so you know, because this is what we're talking about here, isn't it? Conceptually, you know, it, you know, that when people when photographers sell presets for Lightroom or or actions for Photoshop or whatever it might be, what they're doing is they're saying, I've done some work for you to create a certain look using a tool with certain capabilities, and I'm prepared to sell that to you for a small amount of money. The tools think, you're working with are very different, of course. Um, but uh, you know, you, you can imagine a world, I'm sure, where where actually, uh, if if those engines that we're using for our post production, our creative post production, are evolving, then somebody somewhere will sell you a script. Let's call that a, a prompt preset, yeah, you know, or a preset prompt, whichever way round you want to call it, um, and. Yeah, you know, that that could be. So uh, yeah, I, could... I think prompting is is. I mean, people are selling prompts now, left and right, anyway, and um, it, it's pretty much of a scam, I think, because prompting most is, of it is. M- most of it is, is even an... even though, especially as you as you can use um, the 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 language models sure. to help you make better <clears throat> prompts. That's where it yeah. becomes interesting for photographers is, um, and I'm just at the beginning of this journey, is creating small, uh, small models that are unified that you can license. I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing this to license it, but I can see a world where I look at, for example, someone like David LaChapelle, very consistent, um, hyper-surrealistic uh, image maker, that's probably done thousands of images, portraits, um, etc., in his very particular style. Um, and going, I'll license my model, and you can integrate that model, particular model, uh, into whatever uh, algorithm you're 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 using, whether it's Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, Leonardo. I mean, there's many, many now. And inputting. Uh, whatever prompts you want, even your own photographs, and have it generate a style that is really dazzlingly close to La Chapelle, who will have been paid for the license of the model. I can see that happening. It's a little less likely to happen with someone um, who is working in a more reportage sequence, which is really about being there, being close, being, you know what I mean, an observer in a condition, um, you know, that generates the opportunity to take a picture, being at the right place at the right time. But even there, you have a, a consistency of action, lenses, you know, uh, camera, uh, and certainly a consistent film if they are using film. And I, I believe that those large language models, and I'm, I may be just getting to nerdy here, but they are very, very wide, but they're not very deep. And small language models are very, very narrow, but very, very deep. And I think we're not, we're not there yet, but I think we're approaching that soon. So this is the, the James Earl Jones approach, is it then? <laughs> so because James Earl Jones, as I understand it, has licensed his voice, hasn't he? The, the the artificial sure. capture of his voice. Uh, he's 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 the voice behind Darth Vader. Yeah. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Should have mentioned and that. Others. And and he's also many other great things. Yeah. Like he's the dad right. in Coming to America and stuff uh, yes. like that as well. Which is yeah. He begat Morgan Freeman. He was Morgan Freeman before Morgan. Freeman. <laughs> he was Morgan Freeman before Morgan Freeman. Yeah. Right. Um, but so yeah, I, wh- why not? Why wouldn't you? Um, you know, if you could, you know, if artists can, you know, generate some residual income from, you know, capturing what they they've got and, and selling it on, yeah, go. But go it's for it. it's not that big a leap from selling a filter pack with a style yeah. that you've developed, albeit 
a lot more sophisticated. Um, but uh, I, I do think that whatever uneasiness photographers are feeling in using these tools or having others use their tools, they can create their own models. They can adjust their models very specifically, even if it's just with a realm of camera, lens, for example, if you built a model that was all, uh, you know, Nikon F2 motor drive, 50 millimeter lens, Tri-X film, you know what I mean? And then just, again, scraped whatever pictures you could using only that metadata. And then you, <clears throat> you fed in a color photograph of your wedding into that model, would it generate a version of your wedding photo that was shot on that Nikon in that, you know, in the same condition, but with camera film uh, exposure, etc., all delineated by the AI. Is could that be, your could be interesting. Or yeah, I'm, having done that, I mean, many, many years ago, uh, I had to help a friend of mine who'd shot a wedding for some other friends of ours, um, and he shot it half on film and half digital. Uh, and uh, it, we had to sit there for, for an evening figuring out how to make all the digital ones look as nice as the film ones. I mean, this is 15 years or so ago, <laughs> so the digital cameras weren't so sophisticated in those days. Uh, and we were using Aperture, for those that remember <laughs> Aperture, um, yeah. as our tool of choice for editing. Um, and, uh, you, know, that, you know, so, yeah, I can definitely see a thing there. Do you know what, though? Just, just stepping back a little bit from this conversation, this is... This is a really interesting conversation for me because nobody's talking about is photography dead? And none of Chris's you know, workshop participants were saying that AI is the future or wanted to use it. So I think it's, it's refreshing for me to have a conversation where we're talking about how AI technology could be used in support of furthering photography rather than sitting around whinging about all the different yeah. ways it's going to kill it off because I don't think it is going to kill it off. I, d I don't see why it would happen. And, uh, by the way, the one thing that I, I predict is that um, it, we, we now we talk a lot about AI doing this and AI doing that, but um, what is sooner or later going to happen is that these things will be integrated in just existing tools and we will not think of them as AI anymore. It's the same thing with when, when photography went digital. Every, everyone talked about digital photography here, digital photography there, and now it's just photography. Yeah. And the same way the, 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 the technology, the underlying magic that does what you want it to do is going to be so normalized and no one will even think of it as AI. If you, if you talk to Siri and ask it to set a timer, you, you don't think AI, but it is. No, and it doesn't need to be AI either. I mean, yeah, we've been able to load LUTs into cinema cameras for years, right? So, and if not in directly into the camera, then into the monitors that you and the recording sure. devices and stuff. I'm Jeremiah. I'm sure you use this technology all the time, daily. Yeah. So, yeah, the th the other thing is, and, and speaking, you know, here with my hat on as, as somebody who works in a professional sense with AI technology, although not in the creative arts at the moment, um what is ai right because the you know, yes yeah the, the, i forget who it was that says you know that any uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is is uh, no different to magic or well, i've got the words muddled up there but you know what i mean and you um, the you know the, these are just clever engines and and they they have a a probabilistic outcome rather than a deterministic outcome which yeah, um, so so that is the thing that is responsible for the fact that you put the same thing in multiple times you get different answers so yes we live in a world where we are used to our machines creating the same output for a given input and this is not like that partly that is because these devices are probabilistic and not I have plenty of examples where a deterministic engine gives me different results when I put the same thing in. So, Absolutely. So we, so, we, so we know I. there were reasons you had to stop doing software <laughs> development for a living, Chris. If you're writing buggy code, it's going to go... Probably. 
probably well, by the way is, yeah. walking like you know if you were a, a, a photographer i'm sure with a, a one eye on street photography i'm sure that there were moments or, or or times when you literally just went for a walk with your camera slung kind of chest level not looking at the viewfinder and just taking a picture every few seconds as you move through a crowd and then later on looking at your contact sheets or your screens and going, whoa, look at that. Is that probabilistic or deterministic? Uh, it's somewhere, <laughs> somewhere <laughs> now, now in the middle. Now we're getting into very fine semantics. So, so but, but, the, okay, so I, that's, I that's the end-to-end -end process. I was talking just about the tools. So, no, so but I think, sure, I think that's sure. a very, very accurate description of, of, of the process of using AI. Um, certainly, if we take a picture of, of a human with a lens and focus it, we... We're pretty convinced on the other end we're going to get a picture of somebody's face. You know, not necessarily so with AI, though it's getting more deterministic, but also there are ways to create, you know, even they, they use the word chaos. You know, you can, you can ramp the chaos process to make it more, they call it artistic, or, you know, less deterministic is really what it is, where they'll only use a little bit of the prompt or half of the prompt or, you know what I mean, or all of the prompt. And you can, and then when you add weights with your prompt as well, or how much description, you start to get a feel of what's happening. I've been playing with um, trying to get a more deterministic output of reportage photography around specific events, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the outcome is always surprising, sometimes shocking in, in its accuracy. And, and there's no way one could say this is scraped from an image that existed. It just doesn't look it just doesn't look like that so, just, um, so you're going to generate deep fakes then are you well, so, I've, been, yeah. it, so, I've been doing so that for a long time though there's, <laughs> so there's only if i recall correctly i'm not much of an art historian but if i recall correctly there's only one portrait of king henry the eighth and it was painted i think at least a hundred years after he died by a chap called holbein 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 thank you um so nobody really knows what henry the eighth looked like um and so what you've got there is a generative image albeit it's been generated by a person um and it's got and it's not really based on any level of visual fact um so it's, it's an interesting one. so are you saying that we will now have then um documentary uh documentary imagery that has been entirely generated and therefore it is is of course not actually a thing that happened Yes. So this is <laughs> the that's a redefinition. That's so, a redefinition of the word documentary. So, so we're going to yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, uh, well, are you going to tell me that the you know, the storming of the White House didn't happen? It was all just generative AI. Yeah, there's <laughs> nobody there when I looked. Um, <laughs> we are we are getting we are getting dangerously close to the realm of um, the, the, the 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 inability of everyone out there to believe what they see. I, I, I you know I've been doing a lot of uh, you know thinking about that as much as I'm capable of thinking. But but um, you know just looking at the ups and downs, the positives and negatives of of AI um, <clears throat> generally, and and I celebrate the the way the visuals are possible. But and I fear a little less about the deep fakes because I think that at a certain point it will be so confusing that people will look at an image with a jaundiced eye and not necessarily respond. And I'm not saying that that's, that's bad. That may be a good thing for people to be a little more critical about what they're receiving as truth. You know, has it's it been, worked with has it worked with Photoshop pictures? I think it has. 
Are, are you sure that people look at the picture and think, oh, that person can that that person is really that beautiful that can't be photoshopped, or the other way around? That has been photoshopped. I don't believe that that person looks this good. Uh, I, I, is this? Is I think happening? if you're in the fashion business, uh, no, 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 I'm I'm not talking about people who are in that business. I'm talking about everyone else who's not. No, not yet, um, not yet. But I, but I, I think that could be coming, because. Mm -hmm. As we know, AI is very good at, de at determining patterns uh, out of sheer cloth, like really, really deep, uh, deep learning about what a pattern is. And that could be very, very positive in terms of medical, in terms of, you know, creating new antivirals, but at the same time, creating vi viruses as well. So we balance both. I think the, the more dangerous part of AI, as I start to... Um, explore it is less about the image making, though I think that's going to really come into a very dangerous spot over the next election cycle here in the U.S. But language, because our culture, our DNA is all about language. And when you have language models which could emulate a kind of emotional connection, um, with people who this is in their DNA and start to create this false sense of friendship or compassion or, you know, love, um, lust, all of that stuff, we get into some very, very dangerous territory um, here because the, the possibility of manipulating great number of people through emotion rather than just visual which, which is, I think, a little more um, cerebral. So, I, you know, I, I, I do think of the weights of both the visual interpretation, which is the realm that we live in and what we're discussing, as opposed to the language model. And that's why I'm, I'm very interested in, in how to train um, certain language models to serve me rather than me serving it. And, and um, it's an exploration. I, I've not come to any conclusions, nor do I think I will uh, over the next 10 years. <laughs> so, to bring this around, have we determined if uh, AI has already killed photography? I say no, it hasn't. And mm. I Not in the slightest. It, it won't. Not it at won't. All. After that week it of a workshop, <coughs> it, it, it I believe no. it will fundamentally change the economics of photography. Oh yeah, for sure. But that's not the same thing, is it? So, no. um, So, I think people are in danger of conflating the two. <laughs> which is why your group of artists, Chris, um, sounds like they couldn't care less about AI at the moment, um, unless it served the their moment, creative purpose. Yeah. Unless it served their creative purpose, because they and on the there. opposite side, Adrian, the writers are on strike, and this is a because very, of very, AI, very yes. big part of the strike, <clears throat> which is which is AI and AI's use in the creative process, and you know the complexity of even copyright of of something created by AI. So. Um, both sides of the fence are, are struggling uh, with that. But I, but I think that, if anything, AI will probably add fuel to the fire of embracing photography in a new way. Um, I, I think it will be very exciting when cameras integrate um, large or small language models into their actual software and to be able to photograph a landscape and have some kind of deterministic outcome and yet also allow the serendipity of it in the actual lens and final image. I, th I can see that and I can see that that's a lot of fun. That is really interesting. So how about this then, prediction? Uh, well, I'm going to ask you to, to guess a time scale for my prediction. So there's, imagine a phone app which has a model, an AI model on it uh, that is small enough, uh, but the phone hardware is powerful enough to run it so that you could switch on your camera, your, your camera app and in real time see an AI generated interpretation of the image you're pointing your camera at. So let's say you want yeah, to have it like, look like La Chapelle <clears throat> or let's say you want it to look like William Eggleston or Stephen Shaw or let's say you want it to look like... Or Holbein. Or Holbein, yeah, okay, that's, that's yes possibly but let's just you know what what if you said okay today i want to shoot like helmet newton 
right? And then everything you pointed your phone app in real time would show you a Helmut Newton image based upon what your camera's pointing at. How, how long? I mean, the clothes come before? off. <laughs> the clothes come off your okay. subject. All right. So, so that, that, that might be a little bit longer. Um, but uh, yeah, home, okay, Helmut Newton's bad. Uh, Richard Avedon, right? Okay. <laughs> um, except without the elephants. Right, but the uh, how long do we think before we get that app on our phone for five euro dollar pounds? No more than two years. I'd say I'd say quicker. Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. Let's go in there. Yeah. And anyway, who, which which company is going <laughs> to launch that? Is it going to be Snapchat, perhaps? Because they're quite mm. good at putting cat ears on people. Yeah. Microsoft. Possible. Microsoft. Microsoft. Ooh. Micro, mic, well, Microsoft, Microsoft. Is, is deep in bed with OpenAI. And, uh, they certainly are, but, yes. but Google, But Google has Possibly. all the apps on people's and systems. Phones. And, and they phones have phones. And, That's a good yeah, point. So. Google could definitely integrate the hardware even though, and even the though software, at, couldn't they? And currently, Google doesn't look too good compared to OpenAI, but that is going uh, to But the, the, very there's quickly. a lot under the hood that they're not showing, and, and um, yeah. they've got the muscle power. And we should and not discount Apple because we, we have don't a WWDC know what's going coming on. up. Yes. So we, we do. We haven't really heard here. anything from Apple yet, have we? So, so, okay, so in two years, then we're all going to run out and buy Android phones because Google's going to have done the hardware no. and software integration to allow I'm us to run AI sure cameras. Not sure about that at all. <laughs> not <laughs> sure. Whatsoever. No, no, you're but not I, okay. I, I do think that there's a couple of possibilities. Uh, one could also see a company like Ryko, just, you know, sort of one of those below the surface companies trundling along, make an interesting you know, you know, camera. You know who I don't think will do that? The big camera manufacturers. Yes, Canon, Canon Nikon. Nikon, and so Nikon no. I don't they think they do have it. the chops to do that, Me or neither. the people, or the knowledge. Me neither. Anyway, let's, I think let's end this. We, we all agree. Photography is well and good, healthy, vibrant, and will only get more so with the integration of AI. It is. Absolutely. And, uh, and I have brought us, uh, I have brought two picks of the week today. Um, the first one is not photography related whatsoever, but very refreshing. You know how when you open the news... <clears throat> it's all shouty headlines and very clickbaity and so on. Have you heard of Boring Report? <laughs> that sounds I think, no. great. Boring Report is an app that takes the news and makes them boring. <laughs> As in, it it uses AI to strip them down to you can you can you can always click through to the actual article, but it gives you a version that is. Just the news and oh, not the clickbait that. and not the, oh, my God, everything is going to pieces. It's a very, very relaxing news reading experience. That's like 1440 is like that. There's another one it's yeah. called 1440. So I've, I've, I've tried it. I've, I've actually, I will open it almost every day now. I'm, I'm, after we, we go away, I'm getting it on my phone because one of the, one of the problems with media right now is... There's so much of it that you have to shout so loud in order to be yeah. heard. And the, the, I guess the, the decibel level is often conflated with the I, import of the actual... I, I think news. having been in that abbey for a week in a very relaxed environment without all the shouting um, makes me appreciate this even more. I agree. I've been in Canada. Yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, my second one, I will, I will, uh, I will keep that for the end because that is very AI and visual and so on. Um, who's next? Uh, Jeremiah, you brought us. I brought us a photographer who works with cameras. Um, absolutely uh, dazzlingly. <laughs> what a concept! <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought this person is Toshio just Shibata. well. I, I just thought his his imagery there it's subtle um, and it's I think just beautiful in its own way and it's the kind of thing that is that doesn't shout loud but is so considered um, I'm just enamored with his work um, and and shows, do you know if he shoots large format or is, I don't, is that all digital um, I don't 
Because because the pictures have have some some large form to feel. Yes, to them. they they do feel formal. They're they're not quite square. Very formal, they very they could be four by five. Um, yeah. But they're they're just so considered, beautiful, and and balanced. Um, I'm crazy about it, and I thought this would be a good one to just show you how magical pure photography is. It is pure. I like it. Yes, I'm me a too. Fan. Definitely. Yeah, I'm takes my fan. breath away. This this person's work. I love it. And it's yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's stuff that's Wonderful. just in front of your nose. You know, there's there's nothing. You nothing know, pretentious about it. Nothing. And so it draw like you have to be drawn in, but once you dial in, it really opens up a, a world of someone. And it's they're very consistent in terms of style and, and look and, and feel. Um, All right. Anyway. Adrian, you brought us a device. I have. This is intriguing to me. So um, uh, many of our listeners and viewers will will have, I suppose, some experience of, of a Kindle or some device you know, uh, with an e-ink screen. Um, this is a device that's been released, I think, in the last month or so uh, called the Onyx Books Tab Ultra C or something like that, where the C stands for colour. So this is essentially... Um, an Android tablet uh, is like sort of 10 inches or something like that. Um, but it has an, a color e-ink screen. So it's got an app store on it. You can download apps and you can write on it with a pen and it comes with a keyboard case and stuff like that. Um, there's been a, a black and white one out for a while, uh, but now they're coming color. So I, this is really intriguing for me because my, my current iPad is nearing its end of life, I think. Um, it, it's, it's starting to misbehave a bit. And I'm thinking, oh, actually, maybe I could do something radically different, right? And and give my eyes a break and have myself a new medium for you know, editing images for a, a different type of screen could be interesting. Um, so that was that's it. And uh, the company, the same company, um, also do um, e-ink computer monitors. So you can get a 25-inch computer monitor that is a black and white e-ink screen um so i just wanted to raise that to everybody because we all talk about watching everything on our screens i'm just thinking it'd be really nice to have a fundamentally different type of screen technology one that's not based upon being lit from behind for example mm. um yeah I, I love my kindle i've had kindles since they first came out um i, I only use them for for reading but uh yeah the idea of having a whole mini computer with that kind of screen is quite appealing to me I have not really worked with the ink. I know what the ink is. I have used it, but I have not extensively um, used it to read or anything. So um, I would be I would be interested to see how good the interaction works on that because e ink is, I think, inherently inherently a bit slower than an actual. So I, th I think LCD. you're right historically, certainly, and I think uh, the technology is now evolving. So that particular tablet, I, right. I saw it. I saw a review of it on YouTube. And it has apparently um, three different screen refresh rates. So it has a very high quality one for if you're just doing some reading. But if you, you can even watch video on it. Um, yeah. What? Uh, yeah, on yeah. You can e even watch video. Wow. I mean, it's not the best quality. So obviously, it's nowhere near as good as watching video on your phone or, or on a TV or something like that. But but you can, you can refresh those screens now fast enough, albeit at a, a lower resolution. Um, uh, but there's certainly, uh, and I think the way it works is that uh, you choose what refresh rate you want for the app you're using, so that you can have the right level of screen response for for what work you're doing in what app. So, so are you are you going to buy one? I'm th I'm tempted. They're a bit expensive. They're about six hundred whatever's. Um, so you could genuinely get a, an iPad for the same amount of money. Um, so it is definitely a choice rather than just a pick it up on a whim. Um, but with e-ink, you'll probably have like infinite battery life. I certainly much longer, yes. Um, and they now, because you've got an Android app store on there now, you can link into whatever productivity apps you prefer to use and you can have it as your notebook when write on it with a pen and it'd be you know, better than writing on a glass screen. So I think it's just a, a it, it's interesting that that technology is getting to the level where it's good enough to be a personal choice rather than just be a, a, a second rate one device, you know, one, one, one trick pony type device. Hmm. Cool. So I've brought us, uh, a, well, a bit of research, which is not a tool yet, but it will probably be. 
Um, do you remember the good old GANs, the Generational Adversarial Networks? We mm -hmm. uh, remember a website, which, by the way, doesn't exist anymore, thispersondoesnotexist.com, which had uh, generated faces that were very photorealistic and could pass for like actual people. So the, the generative network, they've been a bit silent because or not talked about as much, especially since the diffusion stuff came on the market. But uh, one of the things that the GANs are really good at is speed compared to the, the diffusion models and uh, method. And there is a new GAN out there and it's called Drag GAN or Dragon. <laughs> good name. Interesting wordplay. So... If you want to edit a photo, let's say you have uh, you change something like a, a, an animal looks in the wrong direction, you want to have it look at you or you want to open a mouth or you want to make a skirt longer or stuff like that, that would be significant effort in to do it in Photoshop or in another um, tool. Well, Dragon changes that. They have come up with a GAN that lets you put handles on things in photos and just... Pull drag it. them here have a look at this this is uh. real time by the way i think this is sped up a little but um here's a, like a cat then they close an eye or they change the position of legs or they put a smile on someone's face or um yeah this is uh, apparently real time very and interesting that is really impressive. that's wild isn't it so so you could use that i think you could use this in conjunction with let's say uh, uh, uh generative network stable diffusion mid-journey and you get a it's not as deterministic but this can give you a tool that you just put no, some handles some of those on and things, drag things around in that little animation you just showed there on the screen some of those things are really interesting because it's making it up new information so yeah. You know, if, for people that think that this might perhaps be, oh, well, you, you move it a little bit and it sort of fudges it, you know, it, it you know, does a sort of pretend 3D effect to move things around. I no, mean, you, it's that, that way was more showing, than that. That was showing a lion having its mouth opened and showing uh, the inside of a lion's mouth, which wasn't in the original shot. It's yes. sa same with a, uh, a picture of a person, actually. Um, the, there was a person who, who was not smiling and was adjusted to smile, but when the smile was put in, it came with teeth. Right, yes. um, and, and the eyes changed and things. So yeah, to, to yeah. So, smile, so that's yeah. that's that's actually generative have, have, imagery. Have you guys isn't used it? the photo, Photoshop neural network uh, face? This is a, it's a very super light version of that. Not yet. Not can, yet. You, you but can, you know, you can move the eyes side to side. You can cha you can change uh, some of the expressions. I mean, it's very subtle, um, uh, and it's in beta, but. Uh, it's a version of that. This is uh, very, <laughs> very, very intriguing. Impressive. I can't wait yeah. to have this on my phone, which Me which either. it will happen sooner or later. In a second, yes. Anyway, I think um, yeah, there's an outlook for tools that will be available soon. So very I can soon. I can hear the music coming. So I'm just going to shoot the horn this in in five seconds. I watched a video <laughs> this week about a guy who had written using Auto GPT two agents that trained them to work together. To, to improve things so it's also almost like build your own GAN using GPT-4 oh, yeah. and auto GPT mm -hmm. things will happen we'll be well maybe not surprised but I'm excited about what's keep going. running yes. keep running <laughs> and keep this. taking photos and keep taking photos <laughs> okay we're online at the future photography and on your socials and yeah you'll find us on video and on audio wherever you want and Discord see you soon on Discord Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.